Good. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the stuff that I've been thinking about and talk about video as an interesting medium for a variety of things. This is not going to be a technical talk. It's going to be much more of a montage of different types of things uh, that I'm thinking about and also kind of uh, some of the challenges that I think are coming up in this kind of a space. Uh, of course, uh, I don't do any of the work myself. I have a really good team of people that I've been working with for a while. Um, and as it was stated also, I did some work at uh, Disney initially, uh, trying to do it. Before that, I'd also worked on sports a lot with uh, other types of companies that you may have thought about. To me, sports is an interesting domain, one, because uh, I love sports myself. In fact, I was a little late this morning because I was watching the end of the cricket test match. Uh, and of course, I was up till late last night watching a lot of Olympics. So, you know, and of course, you know, that, that helps the context. It's one of those interesting domains. I wish there was more research money in it, and I'm going to try to kind of talk a little bit about that too. All right, so, and of course, this is some work that I've done with Disney in the past, but also some stuff I've done with Google recently. One thing I want to actually emphasize is my background is computer vision and actually dynamic systems, and video is an interesting mode of that kind of stuff. So a whole lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about is going to be about video, but also not just being only video. I believe video analysis gets better when you start looking at a variety of other things around in the spectrum. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I'm going to also kind of challenge the fact that video is becoming the new medium that's no longer just for broadcasters, right? It's not just the, the pipe that's coming out of the stadium that either ESPN or, you know, even the uh, team zone, because if you remember the spectrum, and I think we kind of heard that a little bit, the video that's coming out of the stadium is not just owned by the broadcast, it's also owned by the league and by the, uh, the stadium sometimes, and also by the teams themselves. It's a very complicated uh, spectrum, but that is also changing. So just a few simple observations before we get started. Uh, one, I'm going to argue for the fact, and again, this is very ubiquitous. We're talking about big data here to some extent. Cameras are everywhere, and in essence, video is everywhere. Then we're going to talk about the video is one, of course, we've looked at that context here, right? We always think of video as a sensor, something we can use to track players. But video is also a storytelling medium. And in fact, arguably, if you actually go and talk to broadcasters and ESPNs, sorry. Go ahead. OK, sorry. Uh, I was just trying to interpret the gestures. Uh, so within that, one of the other things that this video is a storytelling medium, right? Uh, and in fact, it's a storytelling medium because if you're watching broadcasts these days, they're telling you life stories of people before the game begins, the game begins, and then it's almost like a soap opera, right? It's like, you know, they're trying to get you interested in the players, but then the players do something, and then the heroes, and there might even be a villain, and they actually try to find villains. In fact, just remember, two days ago, the once player, once, where once athlete did this, and that became a big story, and the other people, the Russians were bad. You know, that kind of stuff. So it's a story medium which actually gets to be interesting. You're always looking for, and in fact, it's always fun to watch a game uh, by one country versus the other and actually hear the commentary from both. Uh, it gets to be very interesting. Well, actually, two little kind of instances come about with that. The other thing which has actually become very interesting is that actually these days we can analyze video. You've heard loads of examples of tracking going on, far from perfect, but one thing we can do now is give me a domain, and Peter showed you lots of good examples of this. Once you give me a domain, there are qualified, very good people who can solve those problems. The other thing is we can actually now learn more about the context. And I'll show you examples of that kind of stuff to learn more of it. And of course, you've heard a little bit of this already, I'm sure, until the end of the day and maybe for five years after that, you're going to talk about data, data, data. And that's something which we can talk about too. I'm not going to talk much about it, but we'll talk a little bit about it. Just a few things. One, disclaimers. I'm going to talk about very general things. I'm going to talk about a lot of my own stuff a little bit. I'm going to also be making kinds of just fiction happen today, OK? It's, it's just kind of thinking about some of those ideas and stuff like that that you should be thinking about. Preliminary work. Uh, you know, one of the tendencies, and this is KDD. I know the KDD. Everybody's going to have to put a PR curve and say mine is better than yours. They're not PR curves anywhere in this talk today, OK? Uh, and of course, I'm going to skip over technical details, but grab me and I'll be happy to tell you. This is something which just saw the other day, just appeared on USA Today. And you know, of course, uh, because Microsoft now has these fun devices, 
they're giving everybody one of them on the field. You've seen enough ads. Of course, why is Microsoft doing it? You know, it's an advertisement, among other things. Remember the story? Kind of comes in differently. This is, of course, what's happening a lot. And now they have these video tablets on the stadium on the sidelines. And of course, the whole story gets interesting that coaches, of course, have lots of interesting takes on it. Right? So for example, and I have a tough time complaining about this guy here, Ron Rivera, because I'm a Chicago Bears fan, and he was you know, the only time in my lifetime Chicago Bears have won the Super Bowl. He was on the team. Uh, and he said, I'm against it. Because you know, I have actually analyzed videos for weeks before each and every game. And now you're telling me I can get real-time video feed during the game, and I have to adjust my strategy? I mean, I respect the guy, but this guy's nuts, OK? Uh, I mean, you know, of course, this is a dynamic game. This is a soap opera where the script wasn't written before you got to the play, right? And you have to dynamically adapt to it. Similarly, of course, the other players, other, other uh, coaches have other opinions on this one. Uh, Gary Kubiak, I actually have the numbers wrong here. Sorry, the Gary Kubiak should be showing up in a second. Uh, yeah, that's Gary Kubiak. He basically said, yeah, I love it because I can change everything. The other thing which is, and one of the things, and I've spent actually a, quite a bit of time with uh, uh, football players and stuff like that, these are really talented people. And besides being good and hefty and being able to run into each other like mad people, uh, they actually do really get technical stuff. They actually like to see data. They like to see videos. They love to analyze these types of things. And these are people who have a lot of money. Just the other day, if you were watching it, even the swimmers in the American team were watching videos of other players from just yesterday because they were trying to strategize. That's the edge that they're trying to get by watching videos and stuff like that. So that kind of starts saying is video is getting important. Some coaches are agreeing with it. Some are saying, oh, no, I don't want it. Yeah, there has to be some balance somewhere, right? It's a big medium. I love it when somebody says that you know, it's better than just seeing pictures because when they're looking at pictures, you're not seeing motion. You're not seeing anything. Now you give them a tablet, they can even scribble around it. It's a toy uh, you know, that they can have fun with. I always remembered when we actually started some of our earliest work with uh, Boston College and, and FL pa uh, the Patriots, and this was actually uh, early 1990s, before digital video is what it was. They were actually getting into video analysis at that time. So it's been actually something that's been going on for a while. So what kind of data are we talking about? Let me change the equation a little bit, okay? So one of the things we all talk about it is the fact that all of us now have a sensor in our pocket, a camera. The camera has changed a lot, all right? This was the earliest forms of cameras. You basically have a pinhole, and it reflects on the back. And I can now actually, what I can do is find a painter who can draw the different types of things, because I didn't have any storage medium, per se, right? And this is what basically, and now, of course, we were able to compact this out in 1839 into a camera like this. I spent a lot of time understanding cameras and how cameras are used for these types of things. The evolution of cameras, of course, just notice from 1839, and this is what actually 2000 is the first cell phone camera that came out. And they're, of course, getting smaller and smaller. And now people have wearable cameras and stuff like that. And to me, you know, from this is what I always refer to is, you bow to the camera. And then you stood back up a little bit, and then you really kind of distance yourself from it. So it's gone casual. Our broadcasters are still bound to the camera, right? They're setting it up on a tripod. The content quality, of course, is really good. On this spectrum, when you move out there, uh, we get selfies and a whole lot of other stuff that I don't want to talk about. But the content gets junkier, right? But there is this spectrum that actually is very interesting. So casual videos are out there more and more. And this just actually, I love to show this, is if you just look at this, you know, initially, of course, there were cameras like this. And then you start looking at the yellow lines are all mobile cameras. To really look at it, we have to zoom out. And we have to keep zooming out. We have to keep zooming out. That's the number of cameras out there in the world. So that's, if you remember, a camera was a sensor and a storytelling medium, the paradigm is changing. The paradigm is changing now. Everybody has a camera in their hands. We don't know how to leverage that yet. I'm a computer vision person. This is actually an amazing storyline for me because more and more data is showing up. That changing is my equation. I have to think about it, right? So that's where actually, you know, kind of looking at it. And the numbers, and this is actually an old slide, 3 billion, actually, I bet you the number of cameras out there in use is equal to the human population. This might be the one technical device or de device that's actually pervasive and everywhere. And it's actually there in all parts of the world. Maybe perhaps the ratio of humans to cameras 
is lower in uh, the developing countries than here because most of us have more than one. You know, that's the other part of the equation that's coming in. So now, of course, with that comes my whole problem. Now, we, what we're doing is when we even go to places like this, when we go to see Mona Lisa, uh, the old problem now is, of course, going through the crowd, but the next problem now is going through the cameras, right? Because not only are the people occluding the view, the cameras are occluding the view. That creates another whole challenge for us. So, you know, that basically kind of says as well, cameras are good, but I want to be able to experience the thing. That's, I still want to go to the stadium, right? Or a museum. I don't want to be now kind of just being kind of moved away from that phenomenon. So this leads us to think about what is the next generation of cameras. Well, this is one camera that I talk about, which basically has no sensor. As doesn't have optics, doesn't have a sensor, but when you take a picture, when you press a button, it actually gives you a picture. Any guesses how that works? It goes to a look, it has geosensor, it goes to the web and finds a picture that somebody else took of that location yesterday. <laughs> right? Doesn't work in the case of sports, but you know, we can find content like that. So that's where it actually gets interesting, and this one actually is another example of something where now before you take a picture, it actually knows more about the picture you're about to take, and now it basically augments it. So existing images, existing data can be used to leverage newer data. That's one example of that kind of stuff. These are art projects that I'm talking about, by the way. These are not real physical systems out there. So another kinds of things I always talk about, and I'm going to not give a sports example, but there's going to be a movie coming out on this one, the plane landing in the Hudson. Initially, when that happened, remember, other context I'm talking about, Twitter words went nuts about a plane in an unusual location over the Hudson before it unlanded. And of course, with the Twitter words came images like this. People in the meeting rooms were taking pictures. Of course, then the plane landed safely in this instance. And of course, after that, everybody showed up and we got a lot of high resolution images. This is what people found the next day. You can see the plane land. So you know, we have basically what I would refer to as uh, you know, kind of participatory images like that, then institutional images, and then ad hoc images. Images that I found from other places. And this was a security cam on the other side of the Hudson that was used to this. This now starts saying is, we are getting a lot of additional data from everywhere else. What can we use that to understand more about the scene? And I'll show you examples of this one. This is an actually an interesting art slash techno project. Uh, for computer vision people, this solves our whole life. I mean, basically what you do is you take a picture. After 30 seconds, you remember the nice old classic printer? It prints out what the picture was of. How does this work? Any guesses? Anybody heard of the Amazon Mechanical Turk? You upload a picture, when you click on it to Amazon Mechanical Turk, somebody gets one cent when they see a picture of a cow or Ron Rivera. They don't know Ron Rivera. They say, type in white guy. When they see a cow, they type in cow. Both are fine answers. Somebody who knows the kind of cow because that person is a farmer will actually give you the exact kind of feed the cow eats. If it's a football player, will add Ron Rivera. Oh, he was on the 88 Bears. More detail comes in. Solves the damn vision problem, scares the hell out of me, right? So now context gets a little bit in there. Another, think about it because that's happening in sports, folks. There's a lot of people out there willing to give us data. This is again kind of a project what's going on. So now let's ask the question, is video or sensor also a storytelling medium? Uh, what the kinds of videos are out there are, of course, you know, GIFs, because we love this kinds of stuff, right? Uh, you know, anytime I want to say agree, I want to put in a video like this. Or if you're a researcher, you have a different perspective when your paper gets rejected. Uh, you know, but again, content is out there. Remember, this is equivalent to my camera. I actually didn't create this content. I found it somewhere else, and I told a story from it. So this defeats the whole purpose of the sensor. You know, many different types of things happen, and of course, we get videos like this. Stories be like. Lots of videos like this show up. This is another example of videos. Now, again, when you start making cameras things, runners now are putting cameras on themselves and running. Of course, I have Fitbit that tells you how they're running, but I also have pretty scary videos like this. Loads of videos like that with you know, sport cameras out there. You know, remember, the biggest growth market has been wearable cameras. 
Uh, of course, uh, another part of the project we've done is we can actually make these videos watchable, more improve the quality of it. So that's been one of the other paradigms is can we actually make existing videos uh, much more watchable, original on the side, uh, a video that looks at least a bit better to watch. And this is part of a larger system that actually now is running on YouTube and actually is even running on your cell phone cameras and stuff like that. How do you take these types of videos that people might be capturing of their kids playing or stuff like that and being able to upload them and watch them? You know, again, remember, most of the videos we take, we'd love to be able to do what professionals are doing for storytelling for our own videos. So, you know, again, I won't go into details of this one. Let me now actually show you an example of something. I'm at Georgia Tech. We are an ACC team, which basically means I have to talk about my football and everything else. We do have a team that sometimes does win. Um, so here, we're going to watch this video, and I want everybody to pay attention to this. There are many actors in these games, right? One, of course, the most important one is the camera operator. These camera operators are geniuses. They know the game inside out. And remember what they're seeing the world from, because they're watching through this. This is it. Of course, behind them, and I think he was talking about it, there's somebody telling them, hey, what to do? Because there are so many of them. There are so many agents out there, OK? Uh, I hope the audio works on this. Three of three tonight, but those were all inside of 40. From the left hash, 56-yarder, just like last week against Pittsburgh. Kick is blocked. Georgia Tech blocks it. But Jack is picking up back in the 25, and Austin is returning it down the left oh, side. Past the 50, he's got the past the 30, Going nuts. inside the 20, and he's got to be kidding me! And he scores! He scores! Lance Austin picked up the block kick and returned it all the way to the house of the Lots North of End Zone. We've had the miracle on North Avenue. This is the miracle. Three of three tonight, but those were all inside and of look 40. Look at the camera again. From the left hash. All right, nobody knows where the ball is. Everybody just looks like and last week against Pittsburgh. Oh, Kick is no blocked. The ball is. Georgia Tech blocks it. The camera operator knows. The Jackets pick it up back in the 25, right in and Austin is returning it down the left oh, side. Past the 50. Blocker. Past the 30. Inside the 20. And He's got to be kidding me. And he scores. He's lost his voice. He scores. Lance Austin picked up the block kick and returned it all the way to the house. Okay. The point that I was one, one I was saying is camera operators know what's going on. There's a whole lot of other stuff. Audience knows what's going on. And in that instance, I was watching this game live. I had no idea where the ball was. Nobody in the audience knew where the ball was. But somehow the other camera operator. <laughs> What the hell's going on? And of course, the, there's a lot of other stuff going on. The audience is looking at different types of things and stuff like that. That's an important set of cues that we want to start thinking about a little bit. And of course, it gets complicated when I start thinking about the amount of pictures that the people in the audience were taking when they were watching this game. Right? Lots of people were taking pictures and stuff like that. So there was tweeting going on. Uh, God knows what else is going on. So that kind of starts saying a video, a story medium. And of course, that's where things are growing. Another part that I want to point out is that video is where big data is. 90 to 80% of your disk space is full of video. Most of the content, we have no idea what's on it. Okay? Most of the content, we don't know. About 80% of your bandwidth to your home is video. Netflix is 34%, YouTube is 13%, stuff like that, off that 80%. Huge amount of content is video. These days with Olympics, I was yesterday while I was having dinner watching Olympics on my cell phone. This morning I was watching cricket on cell phone, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know where the data rates are going to come from, but we're going to worry about that later. All right. So now let's get into analysis of video. Okay. How can we actually get into doing things kind of stuff? Now let's go to video as a sensor. What I'd love to do is, I would love to, uh, this is from, I know I should have found something from diving on something. This is an old video. One click, I have the whole behavior, motion of uh, Yuna Kim in this instance, tracked, modeled. This is a YouTube video. I didn't put camera out there in that space myself. This is, you know, again, YouTube has got a lot of videos like this. What I'd love to do is analyze this kind of video and learn from this more about what ice skating is, get towards more detailed analysis. Now, I know that perhaps 
Uh, for cases of baseball swings, the uh, football teams or baseball teams have a lot of money. They can put 3D motion capture systems in there. Trust me, they've all kind of sold those by now too. Uh, in football and soccer, there are other types of much better higher end stuff. But ice skating, while of course you're not Kim and makes enough money to do it, I want to do this for my daughter, my son. Love to be able to do this from a handheld camera. And that's where actually the challenges come in. So this is one of the things that my group has been working on. If anybody wants to work on this kind of stuff, we have actually put a lot of code on this kind of stuff. This is not a sports example, but you know, you take HD videos like this, and you want to analyze videos and find different types of things from it. I'm not going to show you the whole videos. This is what the artifact comes like, but what you can do with this is start kind of extracting higher level information from these types, pretty much what I showed you with the uh, Unikim video. And then what we can do with this kind of stuff is, and these are lots of videos, start going into scene analysis beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here. But here you basically can see is I can start analyzing the scene a little bit. But more importantly, what we can do with this is, uh, skip that, skip that, is go to videos like this, again, publicly domain videos, and go into those and mark up regions that I'm interested in. In this case, you know, I'm going to go in. Markup. Remember, those highlights are exactly like the different pseudo color images I showed you of the image, which were segmented regions. And I can mark where things are of interest. I can mark a car. I can track a car. Uh, some of this, by the way, is nowadays running on YouTube also, but much more for blurring things rather than actually tracking things. But it's the same kind of a technology. Uh, again, I'm going through this fast. You can back forward and all that kind of stuff. Let me see. Yeah, then now you can here label a car. Of course, you know, then you can name it, all that kind of stuff, but it's tracking, a car. Uh, we can make it much more fun examples, like the next one here. In this one, what we can do basically is find an interesting object. This is, again, a system that's running online for doing these kinds of things. It's loading all of that stuff. And I'm just showing you video dumps from this. Speed it up a little bit. Here we go, the same kind of interface. I want the old spice. I want to label it. Uh, I pick the, pick the pixels up. I can kind of now say, well, okay, this is old spice. And now you actually notice, this is, again, not video that I actually recorded. It's somebody else's video. It tracks the whole thing, even when the scene completely changes. That's what we want to kind of go towards is much more these types of interfaces to be able to allow tracking of this kind of stuff. Anybody's interested in the vision part of it, uh, have a series of talks and stuff like that, more information on this site. So that kind of starts is we want to start getting towards that. Make videos better, stabilization, segmentation, get into the content of it, extract more things out of it. Now let's look to back into the whole world of sports a bit. So when you see an image like this, as you know, and I'm sure KDD is going to have a lot of different examples of how computer vision is becoming important in knowledge discovery and stuff like that. When you look at this image, you know, there's a lot going on, right? This actually was a different game. Uh, again, I have Georgia Tech theme covered here. Uh, you know, they can give me a raise, hopefully. Uh, so within that, now you see the scene, right? Now I'm going to take all of the great work that's going on in scene classification and apply it to this, okay? And what's going to happen is, of course, we have really good people trackers. I'm going to find a person. Wonderful. Man. I'm going to find another man. And then I'm going to find a camera. OK? And of course, we know that these systems are not perfect. So this is going to become a hairdryer. And of course, now I want to do one of the bigger problems with this is I want to actually come up with a caption for this image. And what is the caption going to be? Because here, there's an action of shower. Because you know I didn't know that this kind of stuff. And of course, the title will be Man Takes Showers While Others Watch. <laughs> But it makes sense, right? I mean, you know, it's context-based understanding of scenes and stuff like that. Of course, instantly, if I had added the fact this was a sports stadium, maybe then it would have been seen man takes a shower while others watch on a sports stadium. But I don't want that either, right? Uh, but that's where I'm kind of start saying is context becomes a little bit more important. So here, we want to actually start thinking about context. I'm going to skip this a little bit. Oh, this was supposed to have been skipped. Uh, so this basically, let's talk a little bit about the stadium itself and start asking questions about what can we learn in these types of environments. So 
This is actually a new paper that's going to be at Multimedia later this year, where we're going to go into an analysis of this thing, but we're going to leverage a lot more than just video. Okay? So here is my video that I'm getting. Of course, in this one, there's a lot of information. What we want to do is, of course, we know about the players. We want to actually also pay attention to the audience. What is the audience doing? We want to actually pay attention to all of those people that actually have these really first class seats right in the front row. They're the ones entering all kinds of content. They're also the ones sometimes yelling when something interesting happens. The audience is also doing this, right? They're yelling when interesting things happen. Uh, so we're basically using that kind of stuff. Of course, there are these other types of people on this side also kind of you know, taking pictures or getting excited and all that kind of stuff too. So again, we want to basically use all of this, and our goal is to generate a set of highlights, interesting things that happen in a game. Remember, it's all about storytelling. It's not just about figuring out what's going on. It's going to the next level. So within that, basically, now we have a system, on basketball at least, that analyzes the environmental sounds, the audience. Remember my horse commentator I showed you before from Georgia Tech? The excitement on his voice. I mean, we have pitch trackers nowadays, right? that can figure out a whole lot of things about what's exciting. And then at the time, we also have these on-court statisticians who are sitting down and typing in so much stuff. I don't know what they, there must be a union job now somewhere out there on this kind of stuff, because these people are brilliant. They can do a lot of stuff. I mean, I know these guys are laughing because they know this world very well. Uh, so you know, these people are entering a lot of data. Then of course, is what comes is something like this. These are actually, you can download them, some of them are copy protected by NBA and stuff like that. There is data access issues remain. But it tells you in very detail what the time was and what did somebody do. Right? This when we all integrated into a system. So we build this whole system where first we take a video. And I think it was a question that was asked earlier is we actually run OCR to figure out from the baseline what the time is, match it to the timeline on the uh, you know, the play-by-play, the -play, because again, those are generated completely separately. Uh, then use things like, uh, you know, what's happening in the video itself. We do a little bit of tracking. Uh, not complete people tracking yet, but just, you know, camera moves. Become one of the things, again, remember, the camera operator moves the camera knowing the content. The director has told them, hey, I know how this story will unfold in the next 30 seconds. This is what you want to do. Michael Jordan has the ball. Focus on him. He's going to hit a shot. I don't care if he makes it or not, he's going to hit a shot. I want to go for that one. So you know, they know these types of things. And the camera operators, we've spoken to a whole lot of them. They actually know the players very well in these professional settings. So we built this whole system. Then we took all these other types of other additional cues, which, for example, includes knowing more about players, score differential, how the story is unfolding, what's the dynamic, right? Is it getting to an excitement point, or are they just getting two points after each other? And, Eh, it's kind of going there. Or there's a huge lead. Everybody's paid and stop paying attention. You know, figuring out the dynamics of this one. What kind of basket it was. In basketball, for example, if you've looked at any summaries and highlights, unless at the end of the game it's a free throw that wins the game, then never show one. I mean, unless it's an important free throw. And there are examples of the same kinds of things in other sports too, and audio. So here, basically, start saying is we can actually start doing what we just talked about. We can look at OCR, start aligning all of the different types of things. So far, we haven't done this. The reason to do this is we want to be able to align third-party sensors too, right? Cameras of citizens sitting in the audience taking pictures. I want to be able to align those two. Because nobody is actually echoing a time code that everybody syncs on. I mean, I wish they would. We tried to get somebody to do it, but nobody listens to us. Uh, but you know, that kind of stuff allows us to start aligning things completely. So now we can learn more about the details of the teams, what's going on. By just looking at this, you know, broadcasters are nice enough to put these types of things at the bottom for us to analyze. Um, usually, by the way, in baseball, it's also very interesting, right? They also tell you exactly which players are on base and not. One thing I must admit I was going to ask you folks, because of the purity of football, soccer, they don't put a lot of stuff on there. In fact, you, they don't even put in what, how many uh, subs are left. The purity of the game prevents you from doing any of that kind of stuff, which is complicating. But basketball, baseball, I mean, they put things up like that, like crazy. And in fact, these are important because they've done studies. This is a side basically saying is, all of a sudden, by putting a whole lot of this kind of stuff, and even the first and 10 yard marker line, brought in a lot more audience to the game. Uh, politics and uh, political correctness aside, actually brought in gender diversity to watch the game a lot. Right? 
that kind of data. So you know, you were saying about data and stuff like that. Some of this data actually has become useful because gender diversity has increased in for fans, and they're actually coming in because they want to do fantasy games, and that has changed the game a lot more too. So while Charles Barkley may not care for that kind of data, there are other people in the world that do. Uh, so, so this allows to kind of doing this and allows us to align different things. Again, I mean, I'm going through this fast to kind of just showcase it, but we can basically start kind of really doing more things about this kind of stuff. OCR aligned, we know what's going on. We have aligned the, and in fact, we can even align the Twitterverse because somebody in this stadium is sitting there, hey, somebody scored. I can align it all because we have time data. Uh, this allows us to start learning more about the game. The other things we can do now is we can also scan and find which are the players on the web. And because, you know, sports teams love to put this stuff up. My star player is this. My second star player is there. They give us statistics. We can scrape them before the game. Know what their statistics are and use that. We can look at score differentials. Is it a tight game, close by or not? All of that information and basically extract from that Again, a storyboard of what's going on. You know, for example, you look at score differentials and team timelines. Uh, we can basically do a lot of statistics on this kind of stuff. What kind of basket? Dump. So we did a whole lot of analysis on this one. This was a pure example of we have the data. Let's do the analysis on kind of different types of ways. And using this, we can come up with. Then you look at audio peaks, audio of this, uh, the uh, commentators, also the audience. We look at all of this kind of stuff. And that allows us to extract more things. We can also look at camera motion, how the camera moves. Because again, remember, the camera operator is focusing on this. Something's happening in that part. If they all of a sudden move to the other side, there's a fast break. I know about that. You know, all those things are, again, very important. Uh, we can model all of that. So here, for example, is a fast break. Now, I know a whole lot of these things are very specific to basketball, and we need to do this for different types of things. We take all of this, merge it together, and now, of course, like everybody else, has a data set. All of this was NCAA data set from the last year, uh, and allows us to kind of now generate questions of which base, which are the you know, clips that are actually good. We did a whole kind of a subject study where basically we showed people two different skits. We actually did a comparison also from uh, the ESPN highlights. Now, one thing you have to remember, when you watch ESPN highlights, because it's a storyboard, while they show the game, once in a while they cut off and show a, the face of the athlete or the spectator jumping up and down. We remove those because we are not actually adding those things in there. We did a comparison just of the sports itself. Uh, again, skipping through a whole lot of stuff because I want to show you a few more things. We did a you know, detailed analysis of all of this kind of stuff. I can show you the paper uh, on this. Apologize, I know this is a data conference. I should be showing you the details, but but now you kind of start seeing that this is detected. You know, these types of highlights are detected straight from our system based on knowing all that it knows. These types of things. This is actually, as I said, uh, this, the, this paper is online. Anybody wants it, look and look at it. And we, you know, if we have slides and all that kind of stuff, that does it. Okay, uh, comparisons and all that kind of stuff. We will skip over this because I want to show you. This basically does a comparison that, you know, if versus ESPN on this game, uh, we're actually doing as well as ESPN. I mean, and considering this is an automatic system, as well is not bad, right? So, and sometimes we miss something, sometimes we don't, but overall it's fine. Okay, skip this. Let me show you more about what we can do. We need to also leverage additional stuff. So this was actually an idea that we played around with a while ago. And this kind of starts saying is, okay, well, let's actually start doing things like uh, this. This is actually a work I did with Disney that kind of situated a whole lot of other stuff that uh, Peter and other people have done since, uh, made it much better. But here, basically, our question was, and let me pause this for a second. Uh, another quote that I always loved in uh, sports was Wayne Gretzky's comment. Good players know where the puck is. Better players know where the puck will be. They basically, they're looking at the dynamics and figuring out where to go before the ball gets there. They model all of the things and kind of learn from it. So we wanted to do something similar. In this case, we took a much more of a constraint setup ourselves. We analyzed the scenes, and from this one, basically started predicting where the players are and the players will be going. So at any moment, three players are here, other three players are there. If somebody of their team gets the ball, those three players will move in a different direction trying to expect to get a pass while the defenders are going to go with them to intercept it. 
That happens in basketball, that happens in hockey, that happens in uh, soccer, football, and all that kind of stuff. We build this whole system to, among other things, and you see the red spots coming in. Those are where we're predicting where the ball will be before it gets there. And we actually did a comparison on this one, and we actually found that we were within about four to five meters of most of the time of the ball getting there. And of course, this was a look ahead uh, and predicting these types of things. And we actually did a lot of analysis on this on basketball uh, and you know, did the same kinds of things. We can predict when about somebody's going to shoot. We can't predict if they're going to score it, by the way. We just know there's going to be a shot. That's it. So that kind of gets interesting on these types of things. By the way, there was another question about using um, video games for doing this. So actually, we did the same analysis on uh, the NHL version of ice hockey. Now, anybody who's played this, one of the things, this was actually an AI question we were thinking about. And these dynamic systems, when they're gaming, they're creating games, they're not doing a lot of look ahead. Most hockey players in the, uh, you know, whatever the NHL game is, they're just standing there until the board comes to them or they go to a predefined spot. There's not a lot of this kind of AI look forward there. Professional games, you see this a lot more. And you start going to the amateur games, you see a lot less. You, we didn't see any of that behavior of look ahead on simulated games whatsoever. Of course, you know, based on data, we can actually improve on this kind of stuff too. Uh, we've enhanced this to work with moving cameras as shown here uh, for American football. So here, if we notice, this is broadcast camera changes, things happening and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things I always liked about from the old days of trying to do this is those lines on those fields are really helpful. They help us a lot. I mean, this is where actually, you know, we can do a lot more types of things. And you can see basically the same strategy of trying to figure out predicting where things are going with these motion fields and stuff like that. We can apply it to full domains like this. Uh, another thing which I always like to do, and this actually show this back into the world of video. If you see a video like this, you notice the camera is moving. Camera is an important actor in most of these types of things. This was a version where we basically generated those camera moves or retargeted it from a much wider view. We knew the wider view, we can move the camera around a little bit, tell you where the story is. And that actually has become a useful tool. So what we can do now is Remember that dull domain of predicting where the ball is before it gets there? We can move the camera there before the ball gets there. So now we can do what that cameraman in my football team did, right? That person knew where the ball was, even none of us knew where it was, because he read the play and he moved it. And then he moved everything else. I'm saying he, it could have been she, I apologize. Uh, you know, and the camera operator could be doing those types of things. So here basically we build a whole system that takes multiple views based on the behavior of the players kind of retargets, finds the best viewport within that video to be able to do the analysis. Again, if you want to see the system, I'll show you. These are, again, series of papers that get into this. So just to close up very quickly, yes, do we need data? I think we do, but I think we have to look beyond the standard things. So for example, uh, this is one of my claims to fame, I would say, and I'm very proud of this, is we actually got DOD. It's being recorded. I might get fired soon, who knows? But we got. DOD to fund us to analyze American football. <laughs> Why? Because what's interesting with American football, and actually is very true even for all sports, is strategies. Predict strategies of what's going to happen before it happens, right? So we actually got, and this was again, I'm at Georgia Tech, I went to my athletic director and said, hey, I have funding from DARPA to do this. And they were like, what the hell? And of course, the good thing was, Oh, the previous coach has left. We have all of this coach's videos and their playbooks. The new coach doesn't want anything to do with them. Here. So we got huge amounts of playbook data and all of that kind of stuff from Georgia Tech and actually most of ACC because it was allowed to us. We digitized it. We started doing a lot of analysis of players and stuff like that. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is the, the, the sad story at the end of it is, you know, when you're in an academic environment like me, uh, the good thing is the students graduate. The bad thing is students graduate. <laughs> what that means is students graduated and none of this data made out to public because nobody spent the time to. And I was going to work with uh, these folks here to one day release it out there and stuff like that. We still have a whole lot of this data down to human tracking because we got the student assistance. By the way, if you know anything about college athletics, while there are professionals doing it, there are student assistants who actually do a lot of annotations. A lot of detailed annotations because, again, remember, as I said before, as Ron Rivera said or other people, these videos are shared with the players for the whole week to study. 
American football is nuts. Amount of data they have and amount of analysis they do. And again, it's human analysis. So we have a lot of this kind of stuff. We run trackers on it, we have tracks and all that. But it's something which again, we've never released. But partly it is, I'm also getting to the extent that while this data is great, and there's no way I will be able to compete with the, you know, the, the kind of data that you might have at uh, you know, your sports teams and stuff like that. Academia will never have that kind of stuff. So share that kind of data with us. But one thing we also need to do is, and again, this is examples of how we can actually do analysis, but we also need to define better metrics. What I mean by that is, and actually I was thinking about in the statement that you said, why was the metric that there was a score? The metric should have been there was a shot on goal, right? The shot on goal is a much better metric than goal. Now, of course, you have to convince the coaches to start worrying about that kind of stuff. So one of the other things you have to start doing is you have to start kind of getting the metrics of what would be valuable back to these uh, coaches and stuff like that. But actually, at the same time, you have to kind of start understanding the domain. So getting a little bit more familiar with the game, the fun part of it is that whole basketball stuff I showed you, the PhD student who worked on it does not watch any sports. So after now, he actually started watching sports, which was great. I was well, like, oh, watch sports, man. Uh, because you have to understand the game to get into the metrics and stuff like that. And I think that becomes valuable. So with that, I mean, again, this is some of the team that actually worked on this kind of stuff. A whole lot of this stuff that I've talked about from the academic side is all on my web page. Please feel free to download them or contact me or look them up on Google Scholar or actually, more importantly, even want to hunt them down. Please feel free to hunt them down. Thanks. Okay, so we have time for some questions. So has anyone got any questions for Irfan? So I might start Irfan. So you had a really good example there with the ice skater. Okay. And so getting pose, you know, I think that's kind of like the next thing in tracking, right? So mm -hmm. can we get the 3D pose? What's required to do that? Is it a function of data? Is it a function of the sensor? Do we need 4K camera? Do we need wearables? Or how are we actually going to do that? I think pose, and how far are we away from doing that? Pose tracking for monocular video is a doable problem. There is enough data out there on the cloud to help you do this. Now the question is, what's the accuracy metric one needs? So, but post tracking kinds of things are getting there. We have to basically understand is what are the accuracy metrics we are going for. And again, remember all of the pose tracking stuff that are actually out there built on cloud data. If they were trained specifically for specific sports, then the accuracy is going to go better even more. And I think, you know, monocular cameras, 4D is overkill personally, I believe. Oh, for, sorry, 4K is overkill. I think just regular HD would be sufficient for a whole lot of this stuff. Now remember, again, this requires us to know more about the game itself. There are a couple of other pipe dreams which I think will be harder. One of them has been is can we actually identify players from video by their jersey numbers? I think that's a pipe dream. There are better solutions out there. Don't use video for that one. Mm -hmm. So do you think um, the frame rate? So you said resolution, you know, you know, we have enough resolution. Is it, you know, with our iPhone, we have 120 frames per second. So is that going to help, I especially for quicker sports? Absolutely. I think getting more time frame would help because we're interested in real motion. So in the example that I kind of showed with the, you know, skaters and stuff like that, I mean, yes, to really get the exact behavior, I need a lot more resolution, both in space and time. But if you're really interested in just pose and where they like looking at, you can get away with it. But if you're really getting towards more behavior stuff, you were doing that. But again, the metrics are there, and my interest really is, I want to do this on YouTube videos. And I think we can do quite well on some of them. Might not the highest accuracy, but I think can be done. Does anyone else have questions for Irfan? So how far away do you think we are from automated evaluation of figure skaters, automated detection of fouls, um, stuff like that. Why do we want all automatic analysis? Well, because you know everyone hates the referees, right? <laughs> subjective, right? Yeah. Like, it is subjective. So one part of the work I did not talk about at all today is actually we've gotten a lot of work going on in assessment. So you know, kind of completely watching things like specific set of motions and giving a score. So, you know, the kind of examples really is gymnastics and diving, mm -hmm. which are actually a little bit much more easier. Uh, gymnastics is still hard. Diving is actually much nicer because you can do the whole post-tracking kinds of things. I think technology is getting better. 
Remember, technology can get as well as anybody else, but you've got to still deal with the culture. So the Ron Rivera's of the world who basically you know, might be the smartest person in the world who's saying, no, I don't want technology. And then you take the same thing to the coaches and the, uh, the governing bodies that do this. And therefore, the problem is. So that is a cultural problem. I think it can be there adjusted. I think we should be able to do much better on very well-constrained domains. And I think you guys have worked on this kind of stuff. You guys are much more focused on the sports domain than I am. And I think we can do much better. Uh, as soon as we convince the governing bodies to start investing more into this. One. So, um, yeah, we've gone over time. So Irfan will be here this afternoon and over lunch, so I'm, I'm sure he's more than happy to um, take your uh, questions. So, um, yeah, let's thank Irfan again for a great talk. Thank you.